Part One of The Affair at the Semiramis Hotel. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Wales. The Affair at the Semiramis Hotel by A. E. W. Mason. One mr ricardo when the excitements of the villa rose were done with returned to grosvenor square and resumed the busy unnecessary life of an amateur but the studios had lost their savour artists their attractiveness and even the russian opera seemed a trifle flat life was altogether a disappointment fate like an actress at a restaurant had taken the wooden pestle in her hand and stirred all the sparkle out of the champagne mr ricardo languished until one unforgettable morning he was sitting disconsolately at his breakfast table when the door was burst open and a square stout man with the blue shaven face of a french comedian flung himself into the room ricardo sprang towards the newcomer with a cry of delight my dear hanno he seized his visitor by the arm feeling it to make sure that here in flesh and blood stood the man who had introduced him to the acutest sensations of his life he turned towards his butler who was still bleating expostulations in the doorway at the unceremonious eruption of the french detective another place burton at once he cried and as soon as he and hanaud were alone what good wind blows you to london business my friend the disappearance of bullion somewhere on the line between paris and london but it is finished yes i take a holiday a light had suddenly flashed in mr ricardo's eyes and was now no less suddenly extinguished hanaud paid no attention whatever to his friend's disappointment he pounced upon a piece of silver which adorned the tablecloth and took it over to the window everything is as it should be my friend he exclaimed with a grin grosvenor square the times open at the money column and a false antique upon the table thus i have dreamed of you all mr ricardo is in that sentence ricardo laughed nervously recollection that made him wary of hanaud's sarcasms he was shy even to protest the genuineness of his silver but indeed he had not the time for the door opened again and once more the butler appeared on this occasion however he was alone mr calladine would like to speak to you sir he said calladine cried ricardo in an extreme surprise that is a most extraordinary thing he looked at the clock upon his mantelpiece it was barely half-past eight at this hour too mr calladine is still wearing evening dress the butler remarked ricardo started in his chair he began to dream of possibilities and here was hanaud miraculously at his side where is mr calladine he asked i've shown him into the library good said mr ricardo i will come to him but he was in no hurry he sat and let his thoughts play with this incident of calladine's early visit it is very odd he said i have not seen calladine for months no nor has any one yet a little while ago no one was more often seen he fell apparently into a muse but he was merely seeking to provoke hanaud's curiosity in this attempt however he failed hanaud continued placidly to eat his breakfast so that mr ricardo was compelled to volunteer the story which he was burning to tell drink your coffee hanaud and you shall hear about galadine hanaud grunted with resignation and mr ricardo flowed on calladine was one of england's young men everybody said so he was going to do very wonderful things as soon as he had made up his mind exactly what sort of wonderful things he was going to do meanwhile you met him in scotland at newmarket at ascot at cowes in the box of some great lady at the opera not before half-past ten in the evening there in any fine house where the candles that night happened to be lit he went everywhere and then a day came and he went nowhere there was no scandal no trouble not a whisper against his good name he simply vanished for a little while a few people asked what has become of calladine but there never was any answer and london has no time for unanswered questions other promising young men dined in his place calladine had joined the huge legion of the come to nothings no one even seemed to pass him in the street now unexpectedly at half-past eight in the morning 
and in evening dress he calls upon me why i asked myself mr ricardo sank once more into a reverie hanaud watched him with a broadening smile of pure enjoyment and in time i suppose he remarked casually you will perhaps ask him mr ricardo sprang out of his pose to his feet before i discuss serious things with an acquaintance he said with a scathing dignity i make it a rule to revive my impressions of his personality the cigarettes are in the crystal box they would be said hanaud unabashed as ricardo stalked from the room but in five minutes mr ricardo came running back all his composure gone it is the greatest good fortune that you my friend should have chosen this morning to visit me he cried and hanaud nodded with a little grimace of resignation there goes my holiday you shall command me now and always i will make the acquaintance of your young friend he rose up and followed ricardo into his study where a young man was nervously pacing the floor mr calladine said ricardo this is mr hanaud the young man turned eagerly he was tall with a noticeable elegance and distinction and the face which he showed to hanaud was in spite of its agitation remarkably handsome i am very glad he said you are not an official of this country you can advise without yourself taking action if you'll be so good hanaud frowned he bent his eyes uncompromisingly upon calladine what does that mean he asked with a note of sternness in his voice it means that i must tell someone calladine burst out in quivering tones that i don't know what to do i am in a difficulty too big for me that's the truth hanaud looked at the young man keenly it seemed to ricardo that he took in every excited gesture every twitching feature in one comprehensive glance and then he said in a friendlier voice sit down and tell me and he himself drew up a chair to the table i was at the semiramis last night said calladine naming one of the great hotels upon the embankment there was a fancy dress ball all this happened by the way in those far-off days before the war nearly in fact three years ago to-day when london flinging aside its reticence its shy self-consciousness had become a city of carnivals and masquerades rivalling its neighbours on the continent in the spirit of its gaiety and exceeding them by its stupendous luxury i went by the merest chance my rooms are in the adelphi terrace there cried mr ricardo in surprise and hanaud lifted a hand to check his interruptions yes continued calladine the night was warm the music floated through my open windows and stirred old memories i happened to have a ticket so i went calladine drew up a chair opposite to hanaud and seating himself told with many nervous starts and in troubled tones a story which to mr ricardo's thinking was as fabulous as any out of the arabian nights i had a ticket he began but no domino i was consequently stopped by an attendant in the lounge at the top of the staircase leading down to the ballroom you can hire a domino in the cloak-room mr calladine he said to me i had already begun to regret the impulse which had brought me and i welcomed the excuse with which the absence of a costume provided me i was indeed turning back to the door when a girl who had at that moment run down from the stairs of the hotel into the lounge cried gaily that's not necessary and at the same moment she flung to me a long scarlet cloak which she had been wearing over her own dress she was young fair rather tall slim and very pretty her hair was drawn back from her face with a ribbon and rippled down her shoulders in heavy curls and she was dressed in a satin coat and knee breeches of pale green and gold with a white waistcoat and silk stockings and scarlet heels to her satin shoes she was as straight-limbed as a boy and exquisite like a figure in dresden china i caught the cloak and turned to thank her but she did not wait with a laugh she ran down the stairs a supple and shining figure and was lost in the throng at the doorway of the ballroom i was stirred by the prospect of an adventure i ran down after her she was standing just inside the room alone and she was gazing at the scene with parted lips and dancing eyes she laughed again as she saw the cloak about my shoulders a delicious gurgle of amusement and i said to her may i dance with you 
oh do she cried with a little jump and clasping her hands she was of a high and joyous spirit and not difficult in the matter of an introduction this gentleman will do very well to present us she said leading me in front of a bust of the god pan which stood in a niche of the wall i am as you see straight out of an opera my name is salamene or anything with an eighteenth century sound to it uh, you are oh, well what you will for this evening we are friends and for to-morrow i asked i will tell you about that later on she replied and she began to dance with a light step and a passion in her dancing which earned me many an envious glance from the other men i was in luck for salamene knew no one and though of course i saw the faces of a great many people whom i remembered i kept them all at a distance we had been dancing for about half an hour when the first queerish thing happened she stopped suddenly in the midst of a sentence with a little gasp i spoke to her but she did not hear she was gazing past me her eyes wide open and such a rapt look upon her face as i had never seen she was lost in a miraculous vision i followed the direction of her eyes and to my astonishment i saw nothing more than a stout short middle-aged woman egregiously overdressed as marie antoinette so you do know someone here i said and i had to repeat the word sharply before my friend withdrew her eyes but even then she was not aware of me it was as if a voice had spoken to her whilst she was asleep and had disturbed but not wakened her then she came to there's really no other word i can think of which describes her at that moment she came to with a deep sigh no she answered she is a mrs blumenstein from chicago a widow with ambitions and a great deal of money but i don't know her yet you know all about her i remarked she crossed in the same boat with me salamene replied did i tell you that i landed at liverpool this morning she is staying at the semiramis too oh let's dance she twitched my sleeve impatiently and danced with a kind of violence and wildness as if she wished to banish some sinister thought and she did undoubtedly banish it we supped together and grew confidential as under such conditions people will she told me her real name it was joan carew i have come over to get an engagement if i can at covent garden i'm supposed to sing all right but i don't know any one i have been brought up in italy you have some letters of introduction i suppose i asked oh yes one from my teacher in milan one from an american manager in my turn i told her my name and where i lived and i gave her my card i thought you see that since i had used to know a good many operatic people i might be able to help her thank you she said and at that moment mrs blumenstein followed by a party chiefly those lapdog young men who always seemed to gather about that kind of person came into the supper-room and took a table close to us there was at once an end of all confidences indeed of all conversation joan carew lost all the lightness of her spirit she talked at random and her eyes were drawn again and again to the grotesque slander on marie antoinette finally i became annoyed shall we go i suggested impatiently and to my surprise she whispered passionately oh yes please let us go her voice was actually shaking her small hands clenched we went back to the ballroom but joan carew did not recover her gaiety and halfway through a dance when we were near to the door she stopped abruptly extraordinarily abruptly i shall go she said abruptly i'm tired i've grown dull i protested but she made a little grimace you'll hate me in half an hour let's be wise and stop now while we are friends she said and whilst i removed the domino from my shoulders she stooped very quickly it seemed to me that she picked up something which had lain hidden beneath the sole of her slipper she certainly moved her foot and i certainly saw something small and bright flash in the palm of her glove as she raised herself again but i imagined merely that it was some object which she had dropped yes we'll go she said and we went up the stairs into the lobby certainly all the sparkle had gone out of our adventure i recognized her wisdom but i shall see you again i asked yes i have your address i'll write and fix a time when you will be sure to find me in 
good night and a thousand thanks i should have been bored to tears if you hadn't come without a domino she was speaking lightly as she held out her hand but her grip tightened a little and clung her eyes darkened and grew troubled her mouth trembled the shadow of a great trouble had suddenly closed upon her she shivered i am half inclined to ask you to stay however dull i am and dance with me till daylight the safe daylight she said it was an extraordinary phrase for her to use and it moved me let us go back then i urged she gave me an impression suddenly of someone quite forlorn but joan carew recovered her courage no no she answered quickly she snatched her hand away and ran lightly up the staircase turning at the corner to wave her hand and smile it was then half past one in the morning so far calladine had spoken without an interruption mr ricardo it is true was bursting to break in with the most important questions but a salutary fear of hanaud restrained him now however he had an opportunity for celadine paused half past one he said sagely ah and when did you go home hanaud asked of calladine true said mr ricardo it is of the greatest consequence calladine was not so sure his partner had left behind her the strangest medley of sensations in his breast he was puzzled haunted and charmed he had to think about her he was a trifle uplifted sleep was impossible he wandered for a while about the ballroom then he walked to his chambers along the echoing streets and sat at his window and some time afterwards the hoot of a motor horn broke the silence and a car stopped and whirred in the street below a moment later his bell rang he ran down the stairs in a queer excitement unlocked the street door and opened it to joan carew still in her masquerade dress with her scarlet cloak about her shoulders slipped through the opening shut the door she whispered drawing herself apart in the corner your cab asked calladine no it's gone calladine latched the door above in the well of the stairs the light spread out from the open door of his flat down here all was dark he could just see the glimmer of her white face the glitter of her dress but she drew her breath like one who has run far they mounted the stairs cautiously he did not say a word until they were both safely in his parlour and even then it was in a low voice what has happened you remember the woman i stared at you didn't know why i stared but any girl would have understood she was wearing the loveliest pearls i ever saw in my life joan was standing by the edge of the table she was tracing with her finger a pattern on the cloth as she spoke calladine started with a horrible presentiment yes she said i worship pearls i always have done for one thing they improve on me i haven't got any of course i have no money but friends of mine who do own pearls have sometimes given theirs to me to wear when they were going sick and they have always got back their lustre i think that has had a little to do with my love of them oh i've always longed for them just a little string sometimes i have felt that i would have given my soul for them she was speaking in a dull monotonous voice but calladine recalled the ecstasy which had shone in her face when her eyes first had fallen on the pearls the longing which had swept her quite into another world the passion with which she had danced to throw the obsession off and i never noticed them at all he said yet they were wonderful the colour the lustre all the evening they tempted me i was furious that a fat coarse creature like that should have such exquisite things oh i was mad she covered her face suddenly with her hands and swayed calladine sprang towards her but she held out her hand no, no i'm all right and though he asked her to sit down she would not you remember when i stopped dancing suddenly yes you had something hidden under your foot the girl nodded her key and under his breath calladine uttered a startled cry for the first time since she had entered the room joan carew raised her head and looked at him her eyes were full of terror and with the terror was mixed an incredulity as though she could not possibly believe that that had happened which she knew had happened 
a little yale key the girl continued i saw mrs blumenstein looking on the floor for something and then i saw it shining on the very spot mrs blumenstein's suite was on the same floor as mine and her maid slept above all the maids do i knew that oh it seemed to me as if i had sold my soul and was being paid now caledine understood what she had meant by her strange phrase the safe daylight i went up to my little suite joan carew continued i sat there with the key burning through my glove until i had given her time enough to fall asleep and though she hesitated before she spoke the words she did speak them not looking at caledine and with a shudder of remorse making her confession complete then i crept out the corridor was dimly lit far away below the music was throbbing up here it was as silent as the grave i opened the door her door i found myself in a lobby the suite though bigger was arranged like mine i slipped in and closed the door behind me i listened in the darkness i couldn't hear a sound i crept forward to the door in front of me i stood with my fingers on the handle and my heart beating fast enough to choke me i had still time to turn back but i could not there were those pearls in front of my eyes lustrous and wonderful i opened the door gently an inch or so and then it all happened in a second end of part one